yeah, to explain it to people which are not familiar, it is, I think, more challenging. So um, as Samuel already introduced, so we're working in, with a different setup. So it is ultra cold atoms in an optical cavity, as you see here on this first picture already. And we pump this cavity and then we op op yeah, can detect the light field and so on. So, but yeah, first I would like to start my talk with in, by introducing the team. So we have a, a theory collaboration with a group of Ludwig Matai and his PhD student, Shim Skolke is running a lot of simulations, which help us to understand. So we all, basically it's always good to have them theory support because they can tune off and on effects you have not under control in your experimental setup. And Jason Cosme is helping us a lot as well. He is a former postdoc of Ludwig and started now his own research group, but we are still collaborating. And on the experimental side, the head of the group is Andrea Semmerich. And there's Pataman Kohambut. She's a PhD student in the third year already and made most of the experiments. What I will show you, you today, yeah, she conducted together with me. And then we have a master student, Sahana Rao. And hopefully soon, um, Evgeny, who is also in the audience, will join us as a new PhD student. But still, um, if there's someone who would like to or is interested, please just contact us. Okay, now you have heard already it is about time crystal, so I want to start a little bit what it is a time crystal. If you put it into Google, you end up with this kind of, of images. So it's very familiar. You find this um, word used in um, science fiction movies. And the first time I think it was mentioned in the TV series Doctor Who in the 70s, where it was powering a um, a time machine. So obviously this is not what scientists have in mind when they think about time crystals. The first time in science, it, it was used the term time crystal by Arthur Winfrey. He's a theoretical biologist. And in the eighties, he used it to describe self-organizing oscillations and rhythm in biological systems. So this is already much closer to what we are doing because we are studying self-organization of atoms in our um, atom cavity system, which then for some parameters enter a, dy um, a dynamical state of matter and start to oscillate. So this is already quite close to what we are doing. In physics, um, the, um, time crystal or the whole research tree basically started with the proposal by Frank Wilczek in 2012. He posed the question in if there are systems in our nature, which spontaneously break time translation symmetry in their ground state. So analog to a conventional crystal, which is formed in space, where it breaks a continuous um, translation symmetry in space. Now scientists thought about how can we realize this? And unfortunately, it was proven quite, we are maybe already one year after, that it is impossible. So time crystals are impossible to realize. Um, and now what the people thought about, okay, this is impossible. The original idea can be somehow circumvent. Can we somehow do something that is related to it? And so the question is, what is possible? So what is, then the research somehow switched to periodically driven system because people found out if you drive your system periodically, so you break this continuous symmetry already in a periodic one and then break this discrete symmetry again in another discrete symmetry, then people realize the so-called discrete time crystal. It is a little bit like you, in the analogy to solid state physics, is like you would offer, you imprint a lattice, you would offer lattice side one, two, three, and four, and the system responds with a larger lattice constant and picks lattice side one and three or two and four spontaneously. Each realization, it is one of these two, and then you break this discrete um, symmetry in space. And it's the same as what happens in, in the time domain that you have a periodic drive, it breaks your continuous symmetry. And then this the system responds with a different period, a larger period, and then spontaneously um, have different time phases. And this was the first time realized in the group of Misha Lukin and Chris Monroe, and followed by many other experiments as also some experiments by Sam Muli, but this was, and, and yeah, and many theory and so on. So unfortunately, I cannot really emphasize all of 
all of what, what is done here in this field, it became rather big. So I'm sorry for people who haven't, I haven't mentioned here. So now I told you we're working with cavity. So cavity is like two mirrors. There's a dielectric coating. So the coating is not perfect. So the photons are bouncing there maybe 50,000 times, but at some point it is lost. So it is an open system by default. And now we thought, or one thought can think about what happens also before we talk about spin systems and in V centers and diamonds and so on, ion, so ions in a trap, so it's closed system. What happens if we, we allow um, for open systems? So we study um, dynamical phases in open systems. This is what we did since years. And there's one main difference. One can also uh, point it out that one can also realize time crystals in open systems, the so-called dissipative time crystal. And, and in, in contrast to the closed system, the dissipation Play, gets actually a positive role. So this dissipation channel helps to stabilize the crystal. So it is necessary for it. So in comparison between closed and open system, for closed system, you can think about you have a system, and you start to excite it, it starts to oscillate and tune out of resonance of your drive. So it does not absorb any energy of the drive anymore. For Open system time crystal is a bit different. There's always the energy flow through the system, but you this is very well um, controlled dissipation channel, there's no energy staying in the system. So the net energy flow is, um, is zero. But this dissipation yeah, is, is important. So we also have realized um, such a um, dissipative discrete time crystal where we periodically drive our system. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go there into detail because I would like to focus on the limit cycle phase and the continuous time translation symmetry. But yeah, maybe it is also something where we, where yeah, you can ask questions after. Or you see here in this publication, I um, marked in red there. There you can find our results regarding this um, periodically driven system where, where it then we observe period doubling and it, yeah, spontaneous breaking of a discrete symmetry. So can we go further as this periodically driven system? And then maybe you have probably heard about limit cycles. Limit cycle was for the first time used in a mathematical context by Henri Poincaré and well established in classical nonlinear dynamics. There most of the people know it. So it's somehow defined as so one definition could be you have a closed trajectory here. We have a, this Poincaré map. So you have a closed trajectory in your phase space, which is approached by at least one other trajectory. And if it approaches the, the, the closed one in infinite time, it is a stable limit cycle. That means if you leave this closed trajectory, you are pushed back. So it, it's stabilized. If it, if it approaches the closed trajectory in um, min time minus infinity, then it is a instable limit cycle because you are pushed out of this closed trajectory. For example, in, in in real life, you maybe, I hope you haven't experienced like it on airplanes because sometimes the wings start to oscillate. So this is, if it, um, if for, for a different, for, for a yeah, precise speed. So what do you think about you put energy in the system and then the, the wings start to form with some oscillation. And if this gets too strong, it breaks. It can also happen for bridges. Or if you think about your windows, then sometimes you have this blind and if there's the window is open and it blows against you hear this, this annoying noise. This is also like the, the blind then shaking some limit cycles. Fortunately, I, it's difficult in Zoom talks to show videos, but if you just put flutter oscillations in, in YouTube, you can find a bunch of examples. In this kind of systems, there were continuous um, time crystals proposed. So in this kind of open driven system where, where then a system, you, it is still not exactly as the original proposal because it is an, in an excited state, but the, your, your pump is time independent. So you excite your system, you continuously pump it, it then the system spontaneously switch into a periodic motion. And there I want to mention that there's some very nice related work by 
Samuli, who in, invited me basically and introduced me. So please have a look for this and study it. You are probably all more expert than me about this, but I found it really exciting, this work. So now I talked about this limit cycle, then that it, they, it starts the spontaneous oscillation, but what is what we want to see? What are the essential conditions for a limit cycle? So first, we want to have spontaneous symmetry breaking. So in each oscillation, if we repeat our experiment many times, the time phase should um, take random values between zero and two pi. So it's like when a normal crystal is formed, you have an intrinsic frequency, so the lattice constant intrinsic period, but where the lattice is pinned, this is different for each realization. So it can be, it has infinite um, possibilities and you break this continuous symmetry where it's a homogeneous medium into the discrete one where you build up the lattice, but where it's pinned is always different. In the time domain, it would be like it oscillates with the same frequency, but the phase of the, the oscillation. So when it starts is random. And second, we want to observe persistent oscillation, which are robust against and temporal, temporal perturbations, for example, quantum noise. Fluctuations are associated with dissipation, or even um, you, you poke your system, you add artificially some noise, and you want to see that the system still um, show um, yeah, stable oscillations. These are the main um, conditions. And to summarize this, so in the end, what a time crystal is, it is a many body system which has following properties. So many body system means like we have some interaction between the particles in the system. It is not only single particle physics, but they have need to be on many body oscillation and due and uh, not oscillation interaction. And due to this interaction, the system is somehow robust against um, perturbations. In our case, this many body interaction is an all to all interaction mediated by the cavity. You can think about if there's one atom scatters a photon in our cavity, the whole, all the atoms feel this, the field of this photon because it is delocalized in, in the cavity mode. And this leads to an all interaction because between all the atoms and this makes the system especially um, robust. And so this robust system with a many body interaction. So we want to have a intrinsic frequency as we have for a normal conventional crystal intrinsic lattice constant. We want to um, show spontaneous symmetry where we want to demonstrate. We want to have, it should be stable within the, the, the relevant parameters. Like for a usual conventional crystal, you change temperature and pressure, then it's maybe locally start to melt, but the periodicity um, is to, at least within some range of your parameter, um, it survives. In our case, we have, these are the driving pyramid parameters where we change and want to see that it is not a fine-tuned effect like quantum scars. It should be in some quite some large area in the relevant parameter space where we observe this persistent oscillation. And then last, we want to show that it is robust against intrinsic noise, what we can in the experiment not switch off because for example, our system is always open. It is coupled to the environment. There's always um, a small entropy flow in our system. But in addition, we can also poke it and add um, artificial noise. And then, yeah, this is our, basically the four conditions. I hope I will in the yeah, following part convince you that we, we can observe this or have large, strong evidence that it is in our system. Okay, now I, the next part is about the experimental system. So the experimental system, first one thing you have to understand, there are two detunings in our system. So we have the atoms in the cavity and then we pump it with a, this laser light. And the laser light can have a detuning with respect to the atomic transition. transition. If this is retitune, the atoms are high field seeking, though that means like the minimum of the potential is at the maximum of the intensity. So if the atoms then start to localize, they localize at the maximum of the intensity and they see even more light. And this basically is a self-enhancing process. If we are on the blue side of the atomic resonance, the, the minimum of the potential is at the minimum of the intensity. So if the atoms now then start to localize at this minimum, they decouple from the light field and 
um, yeah, this, this coupling breaks down and then the system starts from the beginning. And this is what we make use out of it to realize um, some limit cycles with then break a continuous time to trace and symmetry. And the second detuning is in the future, when I talk about detuning, I always talk about the detuning with respect to the cavity resonance. This is one of our driving parameters. We, the one is like we st how strong we drive, the intensity of our pump laser basically, and the second is the detuning with respect to the cavity resonance. And in our case, this is always red. And there we observe elastic scattering. We are far detuned from the atomic um, transitions of we in the dispersive regime where we observe basically elastic and um, Rayleigh scattering. And in this regime, we can observe a self-organization into a density wave phase. And this is yeah, where we usually start our experiment. I will explain this a little bit more into detail because I think this is important to understand the rest of, our, of my talk. But first, let me show you the sketch of our system. So we have the cavity, we have the atoms in between, so we prepare a BC of rubidium-87 atoms overlap it with the TM00 mode of our cavity. The coils here show the coils we use for magnetic trapping. The cavity in our experiment is, has is quite some unique feature if you compare it to other atom cavity systems because the field decay rate is, is rather small. So this you can understand the, the distance between the mirrors is quite large. This is technically quite challenging, but if you have realized and you have this very nice feature that the photons spend more time in vacuum, usually they are lost due to roughness, surface roughnesses on the mirror or non-perfect um, coating. So the lifetime is larger as longer your cavity gets. And in our case, it is, this sets the time, or not in our case, but this um, field K rate and the lifetime of the field basically sets the time scale, how long it takes to build up the field, what is the reaction on changes of other um, parts of the system and the time scale which is set for the atomic part. So the atomic density is set by the recoil frequency and these two frequencies are very comparable. And this in the end leads to, an, the cavity helps to mediate this all-to-all -all interaction. But in our case, it is important that it's a retarded all-to-all -all interaction. So the field is usually always a little bit behind. And this means like if this, the atoms then start to, to scatter, then the field is built up but it's still a little bit behind. And if the atom then, then um, localizes minimum intensity and it is not favored anymore and they start to go back, to turn back, in the initial state, the field is still increasing and though there's always a little bit of delay. In this broadband cavities, you would then it would shoot up the field and drop. So you would see like this positive. And now if you can think about low pass filter this because the time scales are different, then you end up with some periodic oscillation which is important and makes our system um, quite unique. This is a, a picture of our system, actually. This is how it really looks like. Here you see the three coils I had before in this picture. Let me go back. These three coils are here. Here in the center, this yellow ghost is basically, uh, is our, the atoms are in, in our mag magneto-optical trap. So this is a pre-cooling stage. They are basically on the way to form our time crystal and the cavity mirror. Here you see this metal tube and here on top, it's not this big one. This is a mirror for a different purpose. But here in the back, you see some a little bit of white. Though This is the lower cavity mirror. The upper one is not visible on this picture. But just to give you an idea, this is in the vacuum at a pressure of um, 10 to minus 11. No, it's quite um, isolated. Now, one last thing in, in this introductory part is the accessible observables. So what we can observe in our system. So unfortunately, we don't have the, um, the um, optical resolution to observe our atomic density in real space. So we have not the optical access. But what we can do, we can let the atoms drop and due to this free expansion, we can map the momentum distribution on a spatial distribution. This is basically if the atoms have an initial momentum up, they are further up, arrived than further up. If they have a momentum down, like here, they are further down. So that's how you can map. You do basically a Fourier transform and you can map the momentum distribution into a spatial distribution. And then we take 
a, a beam from the other side and re record the shadow. In this shadow, then we, we can see the occupation of this momentum. This is quite common in, in cold atom experiments, but, but we have an, another observable, which is the cavity field. And in contrast to normal experiments where you prepare your sample, then you do your experiment, then you detect it destructively, and then you start with a new sample again. And that's how you map out the dynamic. In our case, the cavity field gives us, serves basically as a non-destructive yeah, non um, yeah, monitor. There's always a little bit of light leaking through the mirror and we can detect this and um, get information about the dynamics of our system. So there, this, we, we have a single photon counting module to detect really single photons at, uh, after one of, of our two cavity mirrors. And this gives us access to the statistics of the light field. And second, we have a balanced heterodyne detection, which uses part of the pump beam, which we split before using as a local oscillator, so as a reference. And this gives us access, measure basically the field, really. Like, so we get, gives us access to the amplitude and the photon number then the amplitude squared and um, the phase difference between this reference or so between the pump and the cavity field. Well, this is the, the observables. Mostly what I show you now in the future, we, we concentrate on this cavity field because this is the perfect or nice monitor we, we are used to use in our system. So we can get many data points with a single M sample because the sample preparation in our case takes one minute. So this would be quite time consuming um, to observe this um, using the moment, measuring the momentum distribution. So now I, I come to the, to the outline of my talk. So please interrupt me if there's any questions or this was a quite long introduction, but I hope it helped you to understand what comes now. And I yeah, would like to show you two experiments. One, the self-organization phase transition in our, in our atom cavity system. What I present here because it is basically the starting point. So we usually prepare our system in the self-ordered phase. And then from there, we start to drive it periodically. We can shake the lattice. We do all kinds of things. And then due to this nonlinear or to all interaction, we basically observe a lot of nonlinear um, physics. Then second, the main part of my talk is the observation of continuous time crystal. There, I hope that I will convince you that we have good evidence for um, demonstrating continuous time translation symmetry breaking. And if there's still a little bit of time left, I will tell you a bit what we plan to do in the near future. So let me start with the self-organization phase transition. Maybe you have heard about already, though this is somehow an implementation of the Dicke model, of the open Dicke model, because it's an open system. The Dicke model is basically you couple N two level systems to a single light mode. In our case, this is only true close to the phase boundary. So the dynamic and all what we what you see after is not explained by a two level system. You need to um, add more, um, more levels to, to really um, explain even qualitatively these oscillations I will show you later on. So this um, so-called um, hep leap phase transition of the open Dicke model was the first time realized by Vladimir Vuletic using thermal atoms and Tillman Esslinger using um, um, a BC. And the system looks basically like it is sketched here. You have your, your atomic sample in the center of a cavity optical cavity, the cavity is not pumped, so it is empty, but we pump it transversely. So here's a ridge reflecting mirror. So we have one laser beam arriving, so we have a standing wave potential. And now we can increase the intensity of this laser, what increase the depth of this optical potential. And if we cross a critical pump strength, it is energetically favored for the atoms to localize in a checkerboard lattice structure with a lattice spacing of the wavelengths. This and this um, density distribution then fulfills the break condition for resonantly scatter light from the pump into the cavity and vice versa. So to lo to to do this localization, this is of obviously not the the um, 
the ground state of the system, so it costs kinetic energy. But this kinetic energy is compensated by building up this two-dimensional optical lattice. So we increase the system increases kinetic energy, but this is compensated by a decrease of potential energy of the potential energy, and this is why it happens spontaneously by itself. So at the critical pump strength, this is perfectly um, compensated. So it does not um, cost energy to build up this um, rag lattice and scatter photons. There are two possible um, states which fulfill the precondition. Either the atoms can localize on the black or on the white sides of the checkerboard lattice, like here on the blue or on the white dots. Um, if we look on the momentum distribution, we see here peaks at one h bar k. So if you calculate back, this is a Fourier transform, you get a, spa a spacing in real space of lambda. But unfortunately, we lose the phase information because we measure only the amplitude of the momentum modes. So we cannot distinguish these two states. We know the periodicity, but not where in real space it, it is um, pinned. But can we, this, can we somehow circumvent this and distinguish? Yes, we can. And what we, if you think about this, this blue um, circles or the, the, the blue circles and the red one, if it is scattered from the blue and the red, you see that the light field has a phase shift of pi. And if we measure now the phase difference between the pump and the, the field leaking out of our cavity, we, we can distinguish the two states. One problem, as I told you, the experimental cycle is one minute and the stability of our phase reference, unfortunately, only 200 milliseconds. We can, but what we can do, we can re repeat this twice within one experimental cycle. So here on the left side, you see the uh, usual experimental measurement. So the first panel, though so the green one shows the pump things so or intensity of the laser. Red is the intercavity photon number and blue is the phase difference. So where it oscillates so much, there is no cavity field. So basically the noise of the detector takes over. So then we ramp up the field to a desired pump strength. We see that there's a finite cavity field built up and the phase locks to zero. Now we leave the self-ordered phase and we enter again. And then there are two possible outcomes. Either we see the same phase or we see a different phase. Difference. So the, this is the, really like the phase of the light field. And if we do this a few hundred times and construct this histogram, we see two very nice distinguished uh, maxima, which has a uh, probability of roughly 50% each. And this gives us good confidence that the symmetry is real established quite well in our system. So if we now, um, to give a, a little bit, give you a taste of this discrete time crystal, but we realize that we prepare our system as a self ordered phase, then we leave and we enter again and start to drive. And the system, like what you see here in blue, it responds with um, twice the um, modulation period. And so it switches from one um, of the symmetry broken state to the other and repeats it stayed after twice the driving period. So we see a subharmonic response. And if you see, look here on these two possible outcome, they are completely out of phase. So there's a phase difference of pi. And if we do this now many times, we end up with this measurement where you see two nice distinct maxima. So this really is a quadrature of the light field, like phase and amplitude. So it has always a similar amplitude, but the phase is either, or the phase difference between the pump and the cavity field is either zero and pi. And this is a probability of 50, around 50%. And this um, let us claim that we observe a spontaneous breaking of a discrete symmetry in the time domain, or discrete time translation symmetry. So let me now come to the, to the main part of my talk, the observation of breaking a continuous time translation symmetry. I told you that for this blue um, at pump atom detuning, the, the atoms are low field seeking and then they localize at the minimum field and decouple from the field and then the system goes back to its initial state and start again. In this kind of limit cycle, I, yeah, I would like to show you here. So there's related work I would like to mention from the group of Tillman Esslinger at ETH in Zurich. So they have the broadband cavity. They also saw some dynamics in their phase. They saw this self-organization on the blue side, but they were 
um, yeah, unfortunately not able to observe this limit cycle phase as we did, because it seems like what us, our simulation also takes is important to have this narrow band cavity. So, but what we do first, we always record a phase diagram. Phase diagram for us means this. So the X axis is the pump strength, Y axis is the other joining parameters, the detuning with respect to the cavity resonance. And what we record here in blue is intracavity photon number. If we have a finite photon number, we know we are in the self-ordered phase. And then for a fixed um, detuning, so it means like we do slices from left to right. For fixed detuning, we ramp up linearly our pump strength and observe the photon number. And then we see, yeah, we can realize the self-ordered phase. But if you look a little bit more close into detail here, in this part, you see some oscillation. So this was our first thing. Oh, maybe we are able to see this limit cycles, which are proposed for the first time by Francesco Piazza and Helmut Rich in 2015. And later on, we showed this using parameters of our experiment, running some simulation that this um, yeah, limit cycles actually break a continuous time adjacent symmetry. And then we can also drive it and see this limit cycle and pin the frequency and so on. So this you can find in, in this paper here below. But now let's have a closer look here. So we fix our cavity pump tuning, let's say around to five minus five kilohertz. Then we linearly ramp up to the center of this um, yellow dashed rectangle. And then we stop there and hold the ramp constant. Have a look what happens. So it means like for a fixed detuning, we linearly ramp up to our desired pump strings here, which is a little bit above one we recoil energies, and then we hold it constant as good as we can. So we intensity stabilize. So this is really the, the measurement what we really apply to the atom. So it, Keep it as good as we can constant and look on the on the response of the system and it oscillates many, many, many times. So this is a time evolution in blue of the intracavity photon number. Now we are in one state of the symmetry problem. So the, the phase of the light field is rather constant, but the amplitude oscillates. So here it is not like that the, we flip between different um, states of, of the symmetry broken states, but we change, we, we, we cycle through different amplitudes and different density structures, but the phase of the light field is, is fixed. If I talk now about phase, I mean about the phase of this oscillation, the time phase of this oscillation of the intracavity photon. So if you calculate an FFT of this, we see a nicely sharp peak and it tells us the system has a very nice single um, frequency response. And then what else can we do? We can repeat this uh, many times. We did it 1500 times and post select our data because the largest instability in our system is the preparation of the post condensate. So the atom number is not um, um, fixed each time. And we want, and the oscillation frequency depend on this atom number slightly. So, but we don't want to compare and time phases of oscillation with different frequencies, because then it is clearly sure that it defaces. So we've, we've now post-select our data in very narrow frequency window and plot the time phase. So what you see here is the real part and imaginary part of the um, dynamics of the intracavity photon number. And there you see um, it, calculate, it has a, a fixed um, amplitude but the phase of this oscillation. So it oscillates with a um, more or less um, fixed amplitude, but the phase spread nicely, shows a full circle as we expect from the continuous symmetry. So we take random values between zero and two pi. So the phase is basically the angle and the amplitude is the radius. Now, if you look on two individual realizations, the pink and purple one, it shows nicely the two oscillations, which are out to face almost by pi. To support a little bit our argument, because could be that we have technical instabilities, which leads to the spread of the phase. Our colleagues ran some tankated Wigner and um, simulations using the tankated Wigner approximation. There they account for stochastic noise due to the openness of the system and the noise and included or in the weakness distribution in the initial states. And there, this is already enough to she show this two pi. So this is a completely clean model, very symmetric and everything. So this gives us a hint that this phase spread, what we observe is not 
can be explained by quantum noise. And this is basically what I try to claim. And then in addition, told you we want to observe stability region or there we look, um, we want to see that here is X axis again, the pump strings, Y axis is a um, clarity pump tuning. We want to see that we, we ramp number to fix parameters and then hold the, all parameters constant. And what is plotted here in red as a crystal relative crystal infraction is like the peak of this, um, um, yeah, of, of the peak in our free spectrum. And we can also look on the position. This is a frequency. So it is stable with um, quite some big area within our relevant parameter space and the frequency is more or less fixed. To emphasize here, um, stability for continuous time crystal where you don't have a periodic drive and you don't um, fix somehow your frequency is, is like you want, you observe persistent oscillations within this farm. It doesn't need to be the frequency perfectly fixed. This is the same as for um, conventional crystals where if you change pressure or temperature, the periodicity slightly changes, but it is more or less robust and it has a periodicity within some um, yeah, area in this parameter space. And then last, what I um, want to show is like you know, to demonstrate robustness. So the um, noise due to the um, dissipation is already included everywhere in our system. We cannot switch it off. This we can just do in theory and, and do different tries. But what we can do, we cannot hold our pump constant, but we can add a little bit of noise, what you see here. And then we can add more noise and can have a look what happens to the amplitude, so this relative crystal infraction, or so the amplitude in the Fourier spectrum. So this is the Fourier spectrum, and then we can see what happens to this contrast. And if we, we can allow for quite some, um, yeah, quite some noise, but if we increase the strengths more and more, what is here the x-axis, this crystal infraction on the y-axis slowly drops. So we can allow for some um, noise, but at, at some point, yeah, we, we, we destroy the system. But it is not very, very sensitive so that a finite amount of noise will completely destroy everything. So I would call this robust. So now, finally, my, um, my summary. So I told you that we have a money, many body system, which leads to this um, observation of the self-ordered phase transition. And there, for some parameters on the blue side of the atomic resonance, you observe some um, persistent oscillation, which has a nice intrinsic frequency, as a conventional crystal has an intrinsic lattice constant. We observe spontaneous symmetry breaking. So for continuous symmetry, we see this circle, what we um, were hoping when we, when we run the simulations and thought, ah, oh, yeah, maybe at some point we can realize in the lab, and I was very happy to see this, that it is, was really possible. And third, we want to have a show them stability area that is not a fine tune effect like quantum scars. And this is seen here that we have finite error in our parameter space where it is stable. And last, we want to show stability against um, the noise. So intrinsic noise, we cannot switch off and on, but we can add artificial noise and the system still is, is stable. Yeah, this is actually now I'm at the end of my talk and the time is also over. So yeah, thanks for your attention and please contact me if you're interested in joining our team. And yeah, ask questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation and also a very clear one, it was easy to follow. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, well, I'm not sure whether these are probably just people clapping their hands. But while we wait for um, other people to think about what they may want to be want, want to ask, um, I want to, wanted to actually ask you many things, but I will start with one. Um, do you understand the mechanism behind this um, suppression by noise if you add noise to the to the drive? Uh, is this like theoretically understood? So we are also. Um... Our colleagues basically run some simulations where they add also some noise and change the strengths and try out. Um, but 
still it is not completely understand, for example, which kind of noise. We add just use a frequency generator at white noise. But within this relative or in the with free, in the frequency range which is relevant for our system, we don't need to um yeah put noise at megahertz frequencies because the atoms cannot follow this. And yeah, I think somehow you can think about, you have this all to all interaction and then you can somehow in a simple model what does not explain the whole system, but at least this instability where it start to oscillate, not why it will oscillate and come back. You can describe the system by a collective spin, by a very big spin. And now you can think about all atoms act together. And if there is some noise, it takes a lot of energy to take the system to for the system or for bring the system to deface. So it's a little bit like if you are at some um, demonstration and you hold each other and then someone um, jump in you, you your the system is much more robust if, if you just stand alone. This is a little bit uh, a, a picture how I understand this. And we showed, but what we showed theoretically that even if we increase, if we increase the atom number or then it gets even a little bit more stable but we are already in quite some regime where we see quite as quite stable system but if you reduce we work here with 10,000 so 50,000 40,000 atoms something 60,000 something like this but if you reduce it to 100 atoms that it, it is not stable anymore so it is really important to have this this yeah many body system so for this kind of physics we observe here Okay, thanks. Uh, I think Davide uh, has his hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, hope you can hear me. Um, yeah. Actually, I have two questions. Maybe, maybe one is, well, the first one is related to what you were saying. So the first question was, how quantum must be the system? So, so you need many, many atoms, you said, but uh, for example, when you showed the numerical uh, simulations, I mean, did you use it like a semi-classical model or, or did you solve some fully quantum Let's say equations. Yeah, I would say something in between. So um, yes, we need a lot of atoms and the quantumness. So like we need um, we need a quantum gas. So we need um, the result or the atoms need to be that cold that they are that we have or need to subscribe it with single momentum modes. We cannot just have a thermal gas which populates all momentum classes, then everything would deface. So this is maybe where quantumness enters then for the spontaneous symmetry breaking, we need quantumness. And our model is basically a semi-classical model. We have um, basically, yeah, cross pitaevsky like equations, but we, in this truncated Wigner approximation, we include the spread of the initial um, the Wigner distribution, which gives you rise to initial state. So we treat basically the both condensate as a coherent state. And then we add fluctuations on the cavity and stochastic noise with pokes the system. And if we, and yeah, we need one of this noise to, to see this spontaneous symmetry. Breaking. But we are really yeah, close to the border of where, where it's not a real complete um, quantum system yet. So I would like in the future to, or what is what we plan to do is like using individually trapped atoms in optical tweezers and put them in the cavity and then look for some observables. Um, yeah, some quantum mechanical observables like entanglement between the atom then and the dynamics on that. Maybe this oscillates and due to some strange interaction, it is stable even for 10 atoms and so on. So this would be then the real, real quantum um, time crystal. But beside that, it is not not so much um, quantum. Okay, and and the second question is, what plays the role of temperature in your in your state? Is it the noise uh, that plays the role of, temp of the, the equivalent of temperature when when you think about, let's say, for example, phase transition and a classical phase transition, you know, to 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 a, to a crystalline state and and not and, and not a solid state. I mean, what? Yeah, so the parameters are basic. The parameters are are defined by our laser beam. So the laser beam we send, we have the cavity, we have the post cancer in the center, and we send a laser beam perpendicular with respect to the cavity axis. And this laser beam has an intensity and it has a detuning with respect to the resonance of the cavity. So it's a really narrow laser. It has a frequency below 100 Hertz and a 
at the absolute frequency of, of yeah of almost 400 terahertz so we need to work quite a lot to fix this frequency very nicely so there's a lot of technical effort but this are basically plays the role of temperature and pressure plays the detuning and the, the pump strength so if you see here in this phase diagram like what is here the x and y axis so if we stop here before we can wait forever so we, we did some stability analysis where you basically look on how stable is your condensate look on the depletion if you then excite on the basically you you linearize your model and look on the eigenvalues of your matrix and if they are all negative the system is stable so it means like if you leave then your state you your pushback and this happens here it's really like a zero crossing of the um highest uh, largest um excitation value so here nothing happened and then we cross the, this critical pump strength and then the system switches to the other to this um density pattern and scatters photons and scatter basically even super radiance um photons so it scatters um yeah more as an individual atom because you have this all to all interaction and one atom feels a field of the other and then it increases the localization and then it is really speeded up right so it's more like a quantum phase transition or a thermal phase yes. transition okay yeah and and it has even okay. some dynamic character so when i did during my phd we studied this phase transition so basically the motivation for all this time crystal stuff was not oh we want to do a fancy time crystal it was more like yeah, we studied this phase transition in this atom cavity system and then we went from here to there and had a look on how the dynamics we observed some hysteresis effect here and this um hysteresis area actually when we had a look on it it followed a power law as one know from kippel um um yeah interpretation but still we have an all-to-all -all interaction so we don't have domains we have maybe some excitation, some atoms which are not perfectly on the shaker board. And there are some studies by, by other, by theoretical groups, like, but mostly then in 1D model that there is fra some fragmentation, but there's not really like if you like in if you look on the magnetism of, of, of a medium or something. But this we studied, so but the transition between these two states. And then the next step, what you can do, um, yeah, look. If, if the system does not directly approaches chaos, okay, you don't understand anything anymore, but the first step is then to switch to a state where it at least comes back. So it follows some periodic motion. And this was then basically the main idea. I want to see this dynamical states and so on and how it is stable. And then actually we just noticed that, oh, people talking about time crystals. And they said, okay. oh yeah, it, could it be similar to that? Okay, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Um, well, I had a couple of technical questions I wanted to ask you about. Um, uh, well, first of all, you showed this Fourier spectrum of the of the oscillations. It appeared in page twenty five, but that wasn't the first page where it was. But anyway, it's also there. Um, uh, this this yes yeah. Um, so, is there anything outside this frequency window uh, at all? Yeah, the frequency window is 100 hertz. So it is much smaller than the width of this. Uh, sorry, I mean, this the range of frequencies you sh you're showing here ah. is from 5.5 to 13.5. Ah, okay. If, if I look, does anything okay. appear outside that range? Yeah, I, I see for, of course, a large, here a large DC offset. This comes because it is not oscillating around zero, but then there's only noise. There's not, a, we, we almost don't see higher harmonic for some parameters. Um, if it oscillates quite strong, we have seen a little bit of some higher harmonics, but almost nothing. So this, it is rather clean. It depends a little bit where we, you are. If you go on the, the um, boundary, then the, diff, the problem is like the finite lifetime. So we lose atoms. And this is a, the main problem that we can only observe it a few milliseconds. We improved this already. So now we can do the double or something. But still, it is very difficult for us to distinguish between um, yeah, this time crystalline phase and, the, and where chaos starts, because there we would need to look for much um, longer um, observation times to see really this long range order in time. 
We just know from our simulations, if there would be no loss in atoms, then it would survive. Yeah. All right. Well, then, and, and the last one I wanted to ask is probably a very stupid one, but in uh, in page 23, uh, you show this, um, oh, it's actually here. Yeah. You have this, um, like, um, before zero time, you're ramping up um, the drive, and then it stays constant. And it looks like there are some oscillations in the drive while you're ramping it up. Uh, so can you can you explain what's going on there? Yeah, I think this is um, somehow related to the yeah to the electronics what we have. So our experimental control has a specific step size in time. And we it this here for this realization it's not not nicely filtered. So we ramp the. AUM basically, which changes the amplitude or the intensity, is faster than than the than the experimental control and experimental control is doing like a, it's like stairs, and this is just some leftover of this. The reason I'm I'm asking is that that by by the naked eye, it seems like the periods of the drive oscillations and then the period of the oscillations that occur with during the stable drive aren't actually very far from each other probably they're not the same but but the order of magnitude is the same and i was thinking is, is there any possible interaction with with these two oscillations but uh, yeah you're right that it is rather similar but i i don't think so because in in at least from our theoretical model we can jump in and we can ramp faster and lower and we also here ramp faster and lower and we always get um yes the same basically the same results so I there's see. there's it isn't the oscillation is not excited by this, and I would expect then the system due to dissipation if it is excited the oscillation by this then for it to dying out, yeah. But because then when we hold constant we hold it very nicely constant and this is really a single experimental run so it's really like it, and even the this black curve is really like we have a scope one cable is connected. Um, to a photo detector which gives this pump strength and one is connected to the um, yeah, photo detector which measures the light field coming out of the cavity. It's really a single run and here you see it is rather flat and I would not expect it to oscillate that long if you excite at the beginning. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions at the very minute. And we're approaching 5 p.m. So I will use this this uh, uh, opportunity to say that the next webinar in the series will be in December. Uh, I don't have our uh, table available at the moment, so I don't remember exactly when. Is it in two weeks or three weeks? But but emails and, and adverts will be sent around about that closer to the time. Yeah, it's 6th of December. Uh, okay, so that's two weeks then. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dima. And um, and I would like to well, I'd like to thank our speaker once more. This was um, very enjoyable to follow, and I I, I think I, I learned a lot about the topic. Um, yeah, I thank you are, again for inviting. So please, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. If there are any nice. further questions, uh, we have plenty of time. At least I'm not in a hurry to go anywhere. Yeah.